Hi, welcome or welcome back to a physionic detailed study breakdown. Uh, today we're going to be discussing a pretty intricate topic uh, looking at the effect that the saturated fat palmitate and the unsaturated fat palmitoleate at varying concentrations of blood sugar have on pancreatic cells, specifically beta cells, which are the cells that produce insulin. So we're going to be looking at a study that's going to attempt to answer the, those questions. There's going to be a few different questions that we'll be answering or a few different topics that we'll go over. So if you're interested in a science-based education on that topic, uh, then stick around. Uh, if you're not familiar with who I am, my name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a, a PhD candidate in molecular medicine. I hold my master's in exercise physiology and uh, I've been working in cell biology research, so some of the, the experiments that they've done here I've, I've uh, done myself or looked uh, at plenty of research or been in lab rotations where uh, the researchers have done this kind of research. So I'll be able to detail what exactly the researchers did uh, during these experiments. Uh, with that introduction out of the way, though, let's go ahead and jump into the study because why talk on and on? if we're trying to answer a question. So the question that we're gonna be answering is, uh, or one of the questions, the main question I suppose I'll say, is how does sugar and saturated fat affect pancreatic health, or specifically beta cells? So the topics that we'll be covering are the effects of varying blood sugar, and the reason why I've got blood sugar in uh, kind of quotations is because it's not really gonna be sugar from the blood, but it's supposed to emulate blood sugar concentrations on insulin producing cells, uh, effects of inhibiting ceramides on insulin producing cells, and the effects of saturated fat, specifically the saturated fat palmitate and unsaturated fat uh, palmitoleate on insulin production. And we're going to break all this stuff down. So if, uh, if you're kind of scratching your head, don't worry, I'm going to walk you through it. All right, so all this uh, information is going to be coming from a study that comes out of a, a from the journal Diabetes. It's a pretty old study. It's from, I think, 2000 or 2001, something like that. Uh, it's called Distinct Effects of Saturated and Monounsaturated Fatty Acids, which are fat molecules, uh, you know, saturated fat and monounsaturated fat on beta cell turnover and function. So to begin walking us through this, uh, this is, so this is done in animals. Uh, I, I realize that there's always a good amount of critique uh, when it comes to animal studies, which is understandable. Uh, however, I do have, I did find one study that looked at humans and I will be covering that as well uh, in the future. But uh, for the time being, something that I always have to preface with is the fact that uh, we can't get a lot of these tissues from human beings. Uh, mainly because <laughs> I imagine you're probably not too willing to give up your pancreas, uh, mainly because it'll kill you. So in those situations, the only options that we really have among the, the very few options, I guess we have a few different options, but among the very few options that we have <clears throat> is to get uh, donor samples from people that have died. But in those situations, they have to die in particular ways. They have to be under certain health conditions, uh, as in like they can't be diabetic, for example, if we don't want to study diabetic individuals. So the sample of individuals that we can actually get uh, samples from, actual tissue samples from, and be able to run a series of different experiments on that sample, it, it's just, it's extremely expensive. And beyond that, it's just, it's, it's hard to find those samples uh, in enough of a quantity to actually run a study. So while they do exist, they tend to be focused on animal studies. And I have a video where I, I showed the parallel between human studies and animal studies, uh, specifically comparing on, I think, insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. And there's a good amount, a, a majority of it is a crossover between between the two. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like animal studies are uh, debt. Like once you do an animal study, this immediately proves that 
uh, this applies to humans. We know that's also not the case all the time. So uh, we need to always be cautious. So I always put that stipulation in there because, you know, we have to be realistic. But in this situation, if we want to do any of these experiments or most of these experiments, we would have to use an animal model because ultimately these animals are going to die, unfortunately. So this uh, study used rats and anesthetized the rats. So they took out their pancreas when, so they wouldn't feel anything, uh, took out their pancreas. Then they ended up putting it or ended up breaking up the pancreas and isolating what are known as these islets. So these islets are just groupings of cells uh, which contain like uh, alpha cells, beta cells, etc., which are part of that pancreas. And then they isolated beta cells specifically, which is what I've got illustrated here. Then once they've isolated those beta cells, they allow the beta cells to then fall to the bottom of a dish. And in that dish, then they attach to the dish. Once that happens over, let's say, 24, 48 hours, something along those lines, and it depends on the cell type, then the researchers had the beta cells isolated and could then do experiments on those. The way that they do the experiments in this particular study is that they add glucose, so uh, quote unquote blood sugar, to the media or the liquid surrounding the cells. And they also add a series of different conditions. So they have a physiological or normal glucose level and then they've got a high glucose level and then they've got an extremely high glucose level so the physiological was 5.5 uh, millimolar which equates to for people that get their blood sugar taken uh, have gone to the doctor and, and gotten blood tests uh, that equates to 99 milligrams per deciliter. So right on the cusp of being kind of pre-diabetic, but still on the side of being normal uh, blood sugar levels. Then the, the, <laughs> the middle condition in this situation, but uh, certainly still quite high and definitely in the diabetic range, is 11.1 .1 millimolar glucose, which equates to 200 milligrams per deciliter. So this is definitely a postprandial, a post-meal consumption level of glucose, or if you wanna look at it from a diabetic standpoint, a person who has diabetes for sure. And then the final one, which is kind of an astronomical level of, of glucose, is 33.3 .3 millimolar glucose. Uh, at 600, which is 600 milligrams per deciliter. This would be raging diabetes. I mean, this would be completely uncontrolled diabetes that's occurring in the body if it were ever to even reach that level. So they're using extremes here, but uh, what's going to be cool is that we're going to be able to uh, apply different fats to these conditions or just look at these cells when there's just the glucose applied, so kind of under normal conditions. And in terms of the fats, they used palmitate, which is a saturated fat, or they used uh, palmitoleate, which is an unsaturated fat. And then they use a combination of the two for one of their conditions as well. In terms of the amount of uh, palmitate, they used a 500 micromolar. Uh, I don't, I forgot to convert it, but ultimately that's a pretty high amount of palmitate and the same amount for palmitoleate. And then when they do a mixture, it's uh, still 500 micromolar. Okay, so hopefully that offered some context on exactly how they're going to be doing these, uh, these experiments that I'm going to be showing you. And I'm still going to be breaking down the experiments as well as we go forward. All right, so this is a, well, I don't want to call it an old paper. I mean, 2000s, but um, it's been a while. And I, I, I wasn't exactly, I, I think that the way that they display their data isn't exactly fantastic. Uh, but it's still readable, plen plenty readable. So the way that it works here is that they've got uh, two different experiments. They've got one which is called a tunnel assay, and then they've got another one which is called a K60, KI67 uh, positive beta cell assay. And this isn't specific to beta cells, it's just, these are just cellular assays or cellular experiments. I should say. And in this tunnel assay, what they're doing, or this tunnel 
experiment, I've got a, a small diagram here. So let's say we were to look at a particular beta cell. Inside that beta cell, we have these nuclei, or we have a nucleus, which contains the majority of our DNA. And what this tunnel assay does is the more positive these cells are, meaning that there's more damage, there's more DNA fragmentation that's occurred, as in complete uh, scissoring or destruction of DNA. This is a great indication of cells that are dying. Uh, typically, this is not something that cells come back from. There are ways for them to come back from it. However, generally, we consider it uh, that not to be the case, so that they won't be uh, returning, they won't be surviving. On the other hand, this KI67 assay is a proliferative marker, meaning that uh, this is a indica an indication of the growth of the pancreatic cells, in this case, the beta cells. And then here, so the higher the, the amount for the tunnel assay, the more DNA damage. So that's something you should keep in mind. Then the lower the KI67 positive uh, amount or beta of, of beta cells, then the lower the proliferation or the growth of the beta cells. So they're kind of uh, two sides of the same coin in, in a way. Uh, they're, they're opposite ends. And then here we've got our glucose concentration. So this is our, you know, quote unquote, physiological level. Then here we've got our high glucose. And then we, here we've got our astronomically high glucose levels. So, and then we've got our control, which is the situation where the cells are exposed to no fats of any sort. Uh, they're just being given, or maybe they're given like base fats, uh, just like l really tiny amounts that they might need as well as glucose at this concentration, this palmitoleate, palmitoleate, that is so difficult for me to say for some reason, uh, is the unsaturated fat. So that's what I'm gonna to refer to it as, otherwise you're gonna hear me struggle over and over again. So the unsaturated fat condition, so the glucose, so this is at 5.5 millimolar glucose, plus the unsaturated fat leads to this effect. And then we've got the palmitic, which is palmitate, which is the saturated fat. And then here we've got our mixture of, of the two. And the same thing applies for each one of these conditions again. So, but all of them are the same, except at different concentrations of glucose. Let me quick check my notes here on how they did their comparisons relative to islet at 5.5. Okay. So when you see these stars, that means that there's a st statistically significant difference against that particular control at the 5.5 millimolar. So this is kind of our baseline, the 5.5 millimolar. And we're also interested in the differences that occur as we increase blood sugar levels, quote unquote, blood sugar levels. And in terms of this symbol, which I don't even know what that is, uh, an S, a, a fancy S. I know there's an actual name for it, but I, I can't, I, for the life of me, I can't remember it. So this is a comparison between the palmitate versus the mixture. So the mixture being palmitate plus the unsaturated fat, or the saturated plus unsaturated fat. Okay, so that explanation out of the way, uh, what do we find here? What do we actually see here? Well, we see at normal glucose concentrations with the addition of palmitate that we see a substantial increase in DNA damage. So that's what this tunnel assay uh, indicates. However, what's really cool here is the fact that when it's co-mixed with unsaturated fat, this particular unsaturated fat, we see that uh, it recovers or protects against this DNA damage that happens within uh, the pancreatic cells. Now, if you've been following Physionic for a while, you know that we've covered other studies in rats as well as in humans 
on muscle cells, which are definitely easier to study than uh, pancreatic cells because you can get muscle cells from human beings uh, relatively easily, but you can't necessarily take a snippet of uh, pancreatic tissue uh, nearly as easily. It's highly invasive. So here, this, this corresponds to the same results that we saw with that, that muscle, uh, those muscle studies. So if you're interested, uh, I have a series that specifically shows all that as well, if you're, if you're interested in that. Now, this is at the normal glucose concentration. That's what I'll call it. And then at the high glucose concentration, we see that there's a somehow a reduction in this DNA damage compared to the control at the 5.5 millimolar. And here we see that there's also an increase in this in the DNA damage that occurs with uh, palmitate. If anybody's familiar with statistics, you know that these error bars are quite large, but still, regardless, they still show, there's no doubt that there's a statistically significant difference, an increase in, uh, in DNA damage with the palmitate condition. However, again, the mixture here, they're using a, a higher concentration mixture at zero, uh, 0 0.5. So I think each one of the fats was put at, um, at 500 micromolar and here they're put at 250 micromolar each so a total of 500. so in either one of those conditions you see that a recovery of the dna damage so the dna damage does not occur however in this situation with the extremely high uh, glucose levels we again see this uh, this increase with the palmitate condition so just from this data alone already, we can tell that palmitate, regardless of the glucose concentration, seems to have this negative effect on these beta cells, as in it's doing DNA damage to the beta cells. And we'll discuss uh, some of the mechanisms for why that occurs uh, in just a little bit. Now, looking at the opposite end, so now we're looking at the actual proliferation or the growth of the beta cells, and we find some pretty intuitive effects in that we see, for example, with palmitate, we see a reduction in the growth because if you have tons of DNA damage, why would you suddenly have significant growth in these cells? That wouldn't make sense. Uh, they're, they're struggling. They're under immense stress. So there's no way that they're going to be growing. So there's a, a reduction in the growth. But what's interesting is that with uh, palmitoleic acid or the unsaturated fat, you see an increase in growth. Uh, this is under normal glucose conditions. And again, you see this protection uh, at least ba back up to the control. So with the mixture, you don't get the positive effects, quote unquote, if we consider growth a positive effect. We don't see the positive effects of palmitoleic uh, acid alone, but we see at least a recovery of protective effect back up to the control or the, the unexposed cells, unexposed to these fats. Now at the higher uh, glucose concentrations, again, with palmitate, we see this dampening effect. And here, interestingly enough, we see that at higher concentrations, this positive effect or growth effect with the unsaturated fat is essentially eliminated because the control is suddenly the same, essentially creates the same level of growth. And as we get to even higher glucose concentrations, it seems like the, the control is still just as high as the, uh, the unsaturated fat condition. So this means that with normal glucose levels, so let's say, let's just put it this way, before you consume any sort of carbohydrate, before you see any sort of rise in blood sugar levels, so kind of fasting blood sugar levels, the addition of this unsaturated fat leads to, uh, if, if we were to assume that pancreatic like cell growth is a good thing, which typically it's considered it is a good thing, then that means that you see greater growth with the consumption of unsaturated fat. However, when the the blood sugar levels increase to, let's say, uh, postprandially after you've consumed food, 
or potentially, and this is hard to tease out, potentially if you have chronically elevated blood sugar levels, then these unsaturated fats are not going to have an additive uh, effect on, on the growth of the, uh, the beta cells. So that's kind of an interesting kind of uh, miniature distinction between uh, with this data, which I thought was pretty cool. But let's look at the uh, actual insulin effects. So what, what happens to, to insulin? And for here, for this data, there's one aspect that I'm going to have to reserve judgment on. But for the rest of it, um, there's, there's some pretty interesting results here. So let me walk you through this. So here we're looking at insulin content. Here we're looking at chronic insulin secretion, so the amount of insulin that's secreted over a 24-hour period. And here we've got uh, insulin secretion in just a, when the cells are stimulated. So they're stimulated with uh, a, a more sugar, or they might be stimulated with some sort of drug or something along those lines. And then you see this increase in insulin secretion. So they're looking at the basal before stimulation and then after stimulation. Now this diagram, what I have here is that, again, I just wanted to remind you that these cells come from the pancreas. They're removed from the pancreas. And what's really cool about uh, beta cells is that they don't just produce insulin uh, in the moment. So it's not like you see an increase, you consume carbohydrates, and then they start producing insulin because they get the stimulus due to the increase in blood sugar. So normally what happens is you have fasting blood sugar levels, then you consume carbohydrates, and this is the common pathway. You consume carbohydrates, your blood sugar levels start to rise, and your pa pancreatic cells, these beta cells, then recognize this rise in blood sugar and will release insulin. This insulin is then in the bloodstream and will then connect to all the different tissues in your body and therefore allow these tissues to allow uh, blood sugar which is now elevated back into these tissues, therefore reducing the sugar in the blood because that sugar in the blood is now entering into the uh, peripheral tissues like muscle cells, for example. So what's cool about these beta cells is that they don't just produce insulin. They actually already have insulin produced and it just hangs out at the, the cell membrane here, which I've always thought was really cool that they they preemptively produce this insulin and just put it, they put them in these, uh, these vesicles and just line them right on the border of the cell membrane. So the moment they're activated, then they can just, in, an, in immunology, uh, there's this process known as degranulation, where it's somewhat like this, where it just releases all these granules or all these vesicles. So it's not exactly the same because we're not talking about immune cells, we're talking about beta cells, but they line up right there. It's like they're ready, just raring to go. And then they get the signal, they get the starting shot, and then they just release into the bloodstream. And then after that initial release, then the beta cell has to produce more insulin, packages them into those vesicles, and then continues to release as necessary. So now <laughs> that all explained, the, the reason why I explained that is because the insulin content is what they're measuring here. This kind of how much insulin is actually found in the beta cells before we get any sort of stimulation. And what they find is that in the palmitate condition, we see a, a, a dampened effect. We see a reduced effect. In the, the unsaturated fat condition, we see there's an increase in this production or this initial burst of insulin or the insulin that's found in these uh, these cells. And then the mixture is again a recovery of what you would find with just the saturated fat. So this is really, I mean, I think this is pretty cool data. I mean, you know, functionally, like what does that mean? Well, I mean, I guess it means that initially you could have a, a, a larger burst of insulin which might control blood sugar better initially, but you know, that's all speculation. Now, in terms of the chronic insulin secretion, we see that there's no effect of, you know, versus control of palmitate. So the saturated fat didn't have any negative effects. The mixture uh, obviously didn't have any sort of protective effect because there's nothing to protect against. And the unsaturated fat does see an increase, does show an increase in insulin secretion over 24 hours. So is that a positive? Is that a negative? I don't know. 
I would tend towards positive, but I don't know. So this is the one where I'm just kind of like, this is the data and I'm, I'm just kind of backing off that because I, I don't want to cast judgment based on this piece of data alone. And finally, looking at the stimulated insulin release. So we've got our basal levels, which obviously sh should not be any different because basal levels is when uh, you don't have the addition of a ton of glucose to, to stimulate the beta cells. So there's no difference across the different conditions. And then what we see is with the stimulation, we do see an increase in, well, actually, to tell you the truth, uh, look at it. It doesn't seem like there's technically, statistically speaking, there doesn't seem to be an increase. Uh, I think this might be a, a, a typo, though, because it seems almost night and day that there's definitely an increase. And in your control condition, you'd want an increase in insulin secretion when you add glucose to the uh, to the cells. So I'm just going to I'm going to go forward with the assumption that there is an increase here, but uh, I'll double check and I'll, I'll post a, an amendment uh, to this video if I if it turns out that that's not the case. Then the palmitic acid, we do not see. So we see a dampened increase in the insulin secretion uh, with the stimulation compared to the control. And then with the unsaturated fat, we do see an increase, a substantial increase, even above the control and above the saturated fat, of course, with uh, this unsaturated fat with the stimulation. And then the mixture does recover and also partially increases this uh, secretion of insulin. So here we've got some good evidence, uh, again, that palmitate has this negative dampening effect on insulin secretion. If that's by the initial amount of insulin that's found in the cells to the amount of insulin that's actually secreted uh, after the, the cells are stimulated to secrete insulin. And of course, also with the, the uh, unsaturated fat, we see that there's this, not just a protective effect or not just a, the same effect, but we see an added uh, increase in insulin secretion. So this could symbolize maybe greater uh, glucose sensitive, sensitivity, who knows? Again, I'm trying to be cautious about how I interpret this uh, just based off of this data. Now, getting into a little bit more of the, the mechanism. So, so why is this happening? Why is palmitate always having these, these negative effects? So here we're returning to our tunnel assay, and here we're returning to our KI67 proliferative assay. So this is the one where the, with the DNA fragmentation, and here is the one with the actual growth of the beta cells. And what we find here is that with you know what, let me back this up real quick. So you can have these uh, precursor molecules or these, these molecules, one of which is palmitate. Uh, the, the major one is palmitate actually, uh, that can be converted through a series of enzymatic reactions. So proteins that can interact with these uh, precursor molecules like palmitate and change them. Uh, one of them is called uh, ceramide synthase, and this uh, ceramide synthase, an enzyme, will generate ceramides. What are ceramides? Well, ceramides are a combination of a fat with another molecule known as a sphingosine. So the sphingosine molecule plus a fat get combined to create a new molecule known as a ceramide. Now, why does that matter? Well, ceramides have a function in our cells. But the problem is that if they become too abundant, if there are too many ceramides that are found in our cells, they can lead to a, a, a variety of different widespread negative effects in that they can increase reactive oxygen species production, which is oxidative stress. They can lead to reduced membrane fluidity, which means that, um, which means so if you've got, uh, let's say this is your, your, the cellular membrane, the, the membrane of your cell. Uh, 
the fluidity of your your membrane cells allows the flexibility of that membrane now when you reduce the fluidity of that in certain instances there are positives to that but in other instances like this one it makes the the membrane a lot more rigid so if anything were to happen to that membrane you would get less of a an indentation and ability to move with the environment around it and more so damage that actually occurs so start to see like i guess in a visual very common visual sense you could say it's like cracks start to form inside the membrane and which cause the the separation of the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell to start to uh, disintegrate so that now the cell gets exposed and well dies um, it's kind of like think of your skin your skin is your cell membrane uh, in in trying to make an analogy here and if you poke a hole in that skin let's say uh, if you're if your skin oh, let's say if you're very young then your skin is a lot more fluid in that uh, it can you can you can move it more and it'll just re go back to its original position but as you get older and older eventually your skin starts to get uh, a lot more rigid uh, in that if the same amount of insult or stress were to be applied to that skin then you would get more breaks in the skin which then is obviously a problem and if you think about that in a cellular scale uh, we're not talking about just a, a small break in the skin we're talking about major holes in the skin so think of like uh, like having a major hole in in the side of your body that's a huge problem so ceramides contribute to this problem in that they make the skin or the cell membrane a lot more rigid okay so that was a lengthy explanation for that and then stress reactions which is a really a common way for me to say this but there are a bunch of enzymatic reactions that can occur and ceramides can influence these enzymatic reactions so these proteins these molecules within our cells that are more stress-based so they will indicate more stress to the cell which leads to a series of reactions and I'll show you one of those on, on, on the next slide. But overall, there are these changes that occur within, within the cells that lead to detrimental effects. If that's to the mitochondria, and if that's to the cell membrane, if that's to uh, key proteins that are, that are vital for the cell to function normally. So this is all from the overabundance of ceramides. That was a lot to explain. Now, here we've got our we're just measuring DNA fragmentation again and here we're just measuring uh, the the proliferation or the growth of these beta cells but here they're using fumamycin B1 I think that's the the name of the uh, let me double check that yeah fumo yeah fumo Niacin, fumoniacin B1 is a ceramide synthase inhibitor. So it inhibits this process right here. So the precursor molecule like palmitate or saturated fat would be inhibited from being produced into a ceramide. So what we find here is with palmitate, we see again this, what we saw earlier, we saw an increase in the, the DNA damage. And this is, I think, at 11.1%. Uh, millimolar so that that high glucose but not the absurdly high glucose concentration so again we see dna damage but what's really cool here is when you inhibit this production of ceramides you see this effect is nullified really cool because then that would imply that this this dna damage that occurs is ceramide mediated because if you eliminate the ceramide production then suddenly saturated fats don't have or this particular saturated fat doesn't have this negative effect now on the other hand they also wanted to test do ceramides actually do this this is a, a, a known as a positive control so you want to add ceramides to actually see if you actually can lead to more dna damage and there is an increase in dna damage as well with the ceramides now in terms of proliferation again palmitate reduces the 
uh, level of beta cell uh, proliferation. However, you don't necessarily see a recovery. Well, maybe you do. I'll have to double check this one too, actually, now that I think about it. But clearly there isn't as dramatic of an increase in the proliferation of these beta cells. So it doesn't have as much of a protective effect. And with ceramides, we see that there's a dramatic decrease in these uh, proliferative markers. So this all indicates that this saturated fat palmitate runs through at least partially through ceramides. Now, the researchers also mentioned one more thing. They mentioned one more mechanism that I wanted to throw out here. Uh, it's not necessarily one that I completely buy, but I wanted to report on it anyway. So they mentioned that uh, other researchers indicated that other saturated fats that have that are of a particular size. So anything above 15 carbons. So 15, so a saturated fat is, as I've got indicated here, this is a saturated fat. So you can tell that it's long. It's a line essentially. And that what makes up that line is these carbon atoms. Uh, so just, just know that there are these atoms that are kind of strung together into a line. And if the, the, this saturated fat, this line extends for past 15 atoms, then the research indicates, according to these researchers across multiple other studies, not their study, but other studies as well, that there are detrimental effects to the cell due to the length of this uh, saturated fat. So palmitate is 16 carbons. So it does fit over that 15 carbon marker. There's other ones that are like 18 carbons and there's much, much longer uh, saturated fats as well. So what they postulate, what they thought could be a reason, they have no proof of this to be clear, but they're just pointing this out, just kind of thinking what could be causing the cell stress, the cell damage beyond just the ceramides. So what happens is, so here, if, if I'm going to explain how this functions is here, we've got our beta cell. I mentioned the nucleus, which is where the DNA is kept, right? The genes, your genes are kept. We're not that interested in that, but attached or very close to the nucleus is what's known as the endoplasmic reticulum. The ER is where your cells produce proteins and also are able to package fats or produce fats. Clearly, here we're talking about a fatty acid, a fat known as a saturated fat, and it can end up in the endoplasmic reticulum. So it enters the cell from outside of the cell, inside the cell, and then it gets trafficked or ends up in the endoplasmic reticulum. Here it can be produced into other fats. It can be uh, modified. Kind of think of it like a factory almost. It can be modified into other types of fats. And typically these fats are then, these are isolated fats and typically they're combined into their more uh, packaged form, which is called a triglyceride. So this triglyceride is three fatty acids, so three of these saturated fats, or it can also be unsaturated fats. So the three of these fats are then linked to a glycerol molecule. So that's this top portion of this, uh, this molecule. So that's all found within the endoplasmic reticulum. So it can be produced into that or some other fats as well. Now the endoplasmic reticulum will then send those fats, once they're prepared, once they're, they've been uh, incorporated and produced, they will send those to, to other uh, areas of the cell, like the Golgi apparatus, uh, Golgi bodies, if you're familiar with cell biology. We're not that interested in that, but what we are interested in is that the researchers mentioned that the, the melting point of saturated fats is much higher. Uh, than it is for unsaturated fats. So they were thinking that it's possible that these saturated fats are precipitating inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. What does that mean? It means that because the, the, the body temperature or the cell temperature is at a certain level, that some of these saturated fats are 
staying in their solid form. So kind of their, their, their group together form which is creating these, uh, it's essentially gunking up the endoplasmic reticulum. So these enzymes that are supposed to be functioning, these factory workers in a way that are supposed to be functioning are not able to then work as they're supposed to because there's stuff piling up everywhere from all these saturated fats that aren't, they, they aren't uh, aqueous, they aren't floating. They're just kind of stuck to different components. Do I buy that? I'll be honest, no, I don't really. Uh, but it's something that they mentioned and I thought it might be interesting because if it does turn out to be true, they sh again, they show no evidence of this. But if they did show that this was true, that would be, that would be really cool. I mean, that'd be a really cool mechanism to explain why the cell overall starts to struggle because it can't produce the proteins that it needs to produce nearly as well because you have these saturated fats that are gunking everything up. And secondly, you can't actually produce more of these fats. You can't produce functional fats that can then be sent to, across the cell to, you know, to, to be incorporated into the cell membrane and to be used for cell signaling and can be used to produce uh, other sections of the cell. So all of that has to, is dependent on these factories. Think about any sort of economic system in a way. I keep making these analogies, the body, the economic system, but the point is, there's, there, I'm just trying to create some parallels here. Uh, I'm not saying that your, your cells are thinking about these things. There's no like president within your cells or anything like that that's directing these things. But the point is that there's a lot of interconnection within your cells. So, and the reason why this wouldn't happen with unsaturated fats is because the melting point is lower. And therefore, they are uh, going to be more separate from one another and can be moved around and, and can be more functional as, as, a, as a result. Okay, so that was a lot. That was a lot. I, I'll, I'll give you that. If your eyes have gloss, it glazed over, I totally understand. Okay, <clears throat> so in conclusion, uh, sugar plus saturated fat, and this is important to note that this is with the inclusion of sugar. Uh, plus saturated fat palmitate, especially in increasing levels of sugar, s stress the pancreatic cells, specifically the beta cells, reduce insulin secretion in a ceramide-dependent manner, at least partly through ceramides. And the effects were reversed with the unsaturated fat, here we go, palmitoleate. So this all follows the same general ideas that uh, I presented in a few of the other studies, a few of the other papers. And if you're interested in knowing if this applies to other saturated fats, if you're interested in knowing some of the other mechanisms, then I actually found another paper that also investigates that. So I'm going to uh, release a detailed video on that as well. So hopefully you got some information out of this. Again, I should caution, uh, this is in animal studies. It's also in cell culture. So this is how we figure out mechanisms. I think this is more apt for mechanistic research. Uh, but again, it's so difficult to, to test this stuff in humans because where are you gonna get these tissues, where uh, viable tissues that, uh, from, from individuals? Like I said, it's not like muscles. It's not like you can just take a, a snippet of muscle. You can just, on the, on the surface, just take a snippet of muscle. The pancreas is deep inside your body and giving up a section of that is, uh, is a very invasive procedure. Uh, so there's a lot of ethical concerns as well. So this is the best that we have. And uh, so this in combination with some of the other research that I'll be presenting to you. But if you want to know more about the mechanisms and you want to know more about if other saturated fats like stearate, for example, uh, have these negative effects, then I would strongly recommend that you check out uh, the next video. Until then, have a good one, guys. Bye.